Okay, so hi everyone, thank you very much for watching or listening. Liam Harfrey here today with another episode of Presenting Champions today, joined by fighting legend Steve Banks, the Panda. This man has achieved a great deal in the fight game across multiple different combat sports, multiple of the toughest sports out there, including being the WBC Muay Thai heavyweight champion, world champion, he's competed in MMA, bare knuckle boxing uh, and Valley Trudeau as well. Uh, some of the toughest sports in the world um, took part in the Valley Trudeau Championships in Brazil, so we'll talk about that, we'll talk about MMA, we'll talk about bare knuckle boxing. He's previously competed um, in Thailand where he's currently based, but also the upcoming fight that he has um, very soon as well for BKFC. So we've got a lot to talk about, um, and that one's very exciting because that will be taking place in the UK where I'm based. So uh, fantastic. So Champ, thank you very much for making the time for this today once again. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. No, no worries. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, so looking at the format of this, we've got a lot to talk about. I'm very excited because obviously, you know, we've been setting this up for a little while. Um, you know, because for our viewers, we had it booked in and then I caught COVID. I had to get yeah. over that. We finally got there. COVID so, shuts everything down. Yeah, but health is wealth at the end of the day, you know. But still, <coughs> uh, I appreciate you bearing with me on that. Anyway, you've got a big fight coming at BKFC. I'm going to start with the present day and actually work backwards in time. And let's do All that. Right. So you're going to be traveling over here to the UK very soon, taking on uh, yes. a very, very tough opponent in medical boxing. How are your preparations going uh, for that that fight and that opportunity? Um, actually, preparation went very well. I've had an extremely long camp, very bored, just because it's gone so long. So, I like I like the two week camps. I don't like I don't like eight to ten weeks, twelve weeks. To me, I think it's too long. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I mean, with the obviously the Muay Thai world, you're probably used to um, competing a lot more frequently, and, um, and you know having a quicker turnaround on fights. You know, um, in, obviously in that world, so I can understand that. Um, and how are you feeling about obviously traveling over here to the UK and uh, you know competing in a new country and everything? That's going to be exciting as well because fighting takes you around the world. It is. Uh, I've actually I lived in England. I lived in Nottingham for a couple months. Okay. Um, in oh three oh four, um, okay. and I got introduced to one of the better coaches I've ever actually trained with, was Owen Conroy. Oh yeah, okay. He's one of the absolute best that I'd ever worked with in the past. Uh, my main training partner back in the day was Dan Hardy. Yeah. Amazing. So I got I got to learn what what you can do if you have amazing cardio. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, that, that helps. That definitely helps. Well, yeah. two, uh, two legends of the fight game right there. Uh, it's brilliant. So you're, so you're actually familiar with the UK. That's very cool. Um, yeah, I can't wait to get some rye beaner. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Some black, some black squash. Yep. Yeah. Some black currant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's some good. Uh, that's some good stuff right there. So was that one of your, uh, your highlights then, your favorite things? From being over here in, in the UK, um, one of the one of the funniest things was whenever I had the very first time I ever had tried rye beaner, I took a glass. I'll show you. Took like a glass and put ice in it, and then I filled the rye beaner up to the top because I thought it was a regular drink. Come to find out, you need to add water to it. Yeah, that's the thing. Oh, yeah. well. There you go. Well, definitely you can get some more of that down you um, very soon when you when you're back over here. Um, and obviously we we're all very excited to to welcome you uh, back to the Thank country. Um, so that's going to be an amazing show. I mean, BKFC they're doing amazing things. They're on the up and up. Um, take a look back at a couple of your other fights with them, um, because as I mentioned, obviously we're working backwards in time. So no. you obviously made the decision to uh, to fight medical boxing on. A couple of their Thailand-based events, which are uh, yes. also going up and up. What inspired you to to partake in that? Because obviously you were switching from obviously the kickboxing and, and uh, MMA and some of the other things you've been doing. You're obviously inspired to test yourself in all different sports, basically. I like I like being competitive. Mm -hmm. I like the idea to challenge myself against someone else and just to see who's better. 
Yeah. I just enjoy it. I like being competitive. Yeah, fair enough. I can I can understand that, and you certainly uh, you certainly put yourself in those situations. Like I say, you know, several of the toughest sports on the planet, yeah. not just one, but a few of them. So we'll be we'll be talking about that. But obviously, I've seen some of the fights with um, the KFC Thailand and and everything they're doing. But for somebody who's maybe not as familiar with it, who's watching this, can you walk us through like what the what a show is like, what the atmosphere is a show because. It looks like it has a, a very good vibe there, if you get what I mean, being outdoors and being, you know, quite a good atmosphere. But obviously, I've only watched it. You've actually obviously bought there. So what is it like in, in that sense, you know, in, in the vibe of the place? All right. um, well, I'll start I'll start with the fight that we just had, previously had. The the one the last one that I had was in, I believe, was September, early September. Uh, it was in Bangkok. They move venues at last minute, put us up in the venue, had it. Great crowd. Uh, the crowd is entertaining. They're always cheering, supporting both sides. Not really picking sides, but they're really cheering, supporting. Um, had that fight. The fight before then um, was a rematch. Uh, the guy from Iran, I had fought him in Muay Thai. My first Muay Thai fight in Thailand was against him. Um, I fought him in Pattaya. And, I mean, that was an amazing card right there. The venue, uh, the way Nick Chapman has everything set up over, he's doing very well. I think he's doing a very good job of um, running this side, this side of the show, BKFC Asia. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's um, amazing. The fight, the very first bare knuckle that I had was outdoor on top of a five-star hotel overlooking the ocean. That was amazing. It was yeah. a great view everything absolutely that was uh, i remember seeing that one and that was that was just exceptional but yeah i mean what david feldman's doing raising the profile of ben at the boxing all over the world yeah. just, i've got you know all the respect in the world for that man uh and he's really taken the sport big you know i mean obviously we, we've been doing bare knuckle boxing over here in the uk for um, actually for longer, you know, even in the States. But then he, when, when Dave Feldman's come in, he's taking it to the next level. He's taking it all over the world. And yep. it's, uh, you know, it's got a lot of respect for him. So obviously going back into the Muay Thai side of things and, and your um, sort of main pursuit there, um, mm -hmm. like I say, we're working backwards with this. So I have to ask you about obviously becoming world champion and not just world champion, but obviously the WBC title is very prestigious, very respected. Um, title as well. So let's talk a little bit about basically how it felt to win that. And um, your unbelievable, name. yeah, <laughs> unbelievable. The uh, the night that I won, I took the fight on like two and a half week notice. I was supposed to fight on the twenty sixth, but they asked me if I fight on the twenty third for the WBC World Title, and I got permission. Coaches, trainers, everybody that said yes. We flew in fall. One, when they put the belt on, it was like, I've done it. I've ne I've, I can't believe I've actually done the one thing. When I first started fighting, that's what I wanted. I wanted the WBC Muay Thai world title. And that was the only title that I ever cared about. And I was able to get it in 2017. Wow. So that the, was actually hardest, the hardest part okay. about that night was when they put the belt on you, it's a show belt. WBC sends you a new belt, a brand new belt that's never been worn, etc. It's all packaged up. Well, they took the belt off of me, and all I was doing was like, take my gloves off, take my gloves off, take my gloves off. I want to touch the belt. Because when we did the pose off, I wouldn't touch the belt because it's not mine. I can't touch it because it's not mine. And I ended up winning. I was like just begging. I was like, all I wanted to do was touch the belt. And they took the show belt. Like Thursday, the next week, I ended up getting a, the brand new belt in the, in the mail. It was Amazing. great. Yeah. And I think it's really cool that you, um, that you aimed for that particular title. And, you know, that was there right from the beginning because um, – it's something that a lot of champions say, you know, when I talk to them, that, that like visualizing and um, sort of imagining things before it happens is, is very important. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, that was obviously something you were doing 
um, in that process with the WBC title? Um, for me, I I just wanted I wanted the WBC belt because for me the top belt ever was always the WBC, the green and gold. Yeah. And then I get the opportunity to actually fight for the green and gold and then being able to have it. And I'm not going to lie, for about a week, it never left my room. I get laid in the bed with me. I didn't want to, I didn't want the bed, I didn't want the belt to leave in my bedroom. I can understand that. I can definitely understand that. Um, another thing here that I think people will be fascinated by, because obviously I've got the questions about the different styles you've competed in, um, but you'll have to fill me in on some of the timelines, you know, because I'm not sure of all the timelines. So talk to us a little bit about the transition from the USA to Thailand, you know, because I know you've been in Thailand a while. I'm not sure how long, to be quite honest with you. But I think it'd be fascinating because you sort of took that plunge, you know, um, leaving your home country, going to a new place, yeah. and obviously you, you talking on, on Facebook, you have a great life there. But can you share with us a little bit about like um, that time, you know, when you decided to make the move and everything that was going on at that point in your life? Yeah, um, I've been in Phuket, Thailand for seven years now. Um, seven and a half years ago, I had a fight with Kunlun fight in China, and for me. I got offered the fight. I told them, no, I can't do it. I'm out of shape. I'm not, I wouldn't be able to put on a good show at all. Um, they, they said, okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, they called me back a couple hours later and they said, if we fly you to Thailand for two weeks, do you think they can get you in shape, ready to fight you for a Kuma? Yeah, of course, it's Thailand. I had to take the opportunity, um, came in, trained at Sison Pinong in, in Bangkok, ended up the opportunity meeting Boyd, the owner of Phuket Top Team, and was able to get a sponsorship, came over here for, I was only supposed to come here for one year, and I just fell in love with the place. Amazing, that's, that's how it happened, that's, that's extraordinary, because like I say, I know you've um, you love the lifestyle there and everything, and you, and you mentioned to me you, you you know doing what you love every day, and and it sounds amazing. But I was curious, it's a big leap to take. Obviously, um, the flip side of that is the life that you're living now, um, and you're sort of living well, living the dream basically. I mean, there's no other way to put it from from what you've described. I mean, you're just you're just doing what you love. But in your own words, I mean, share with us a little bit about um, how you've adapted to living there and the lifestyle of people and things like that, um, because you, you seem to love it, you know? When, when I first moved to Thailand, I was 183 kg. Now I'm down to 120 kg. Okay. Um, being able to get fresh food every day, you know, over uh, in the U.S., a lot of things are processed. You're always going to be able to get more processed food than healthy, organic-style type of food. Well, over here in Thailand, obviously, yes, you're still going to get processed. But you've got a better opportunity to get fresh-made food every meal. You're not going to get something that's always been frozen and, you know, throw in the microwave. Most of the stuff that you have over here, they grill it for you, stir fry it right there within a few minutes before you're eating. Yeah, amazing. So it's a totally different um, different lifestyle from that point. But I have heard that about the street food because remember, um, just speaking personally now, uh, Thailand's on the, on the very top of my my bucket list. You know, I've not, I've never been, but it's right at the top of the yeah. bucket list. It's, uh, it is amazing. And obviously, what about the people? Because I hear that the, the people are, are super friendly and the, and the pace of life is, is you know, quite relaxed and things like that. It would be good to get your, you know, feel for that side of it. The one thing I did notice, actually one of the biggest things to notice over here, they call Thailand the land of smiles. Well, it's true. You can look at any, I would say 99% of people, you can look at and smile at them, and they'll smile back. Doesn't matter what level of a person they are. You go back home, you smile at someone, they be like, the fuck you looking at? There's someone's gonna be ready to fight you. Yeah. But back home, it's always been that way. 
they want to know, wow, why, why are you smiling? What, what's so, what's so funny? What, what's the big deal? What are you looking at? Over here, they'll look at you and, oh, hey, how are you? You know, they'll nod, they'll smile, go about their merry day. That's even, they even do that in Bangkok as well. You go back to the U.S., they don't do that. No, no, that's, well, that's true. I mean, it's something uh, I can get where you're coming from um, because the U.K. is the same, you know. There are, um, like where I'm from, you know, it's the same type of thing. Uh, there are a few areas where, uh, like around here, where, where everybody knows everybody and, and it's a bit better, but, you know, and, and that's okay. But a lot of places you have the same thing and you look at somebody the wrong way and, you know, it, it all starts going down. So I, I, I relate to that. I get where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, obviously, winning the world title was an amazing feeling, an amazing achievement. But can you talk to us about some of your other favorite moments in the Muay Thai, um, well, your journey through the sport, really, because as I, as I mentioned, it's one of the toughest sports in the world, um, and I'm not sure how many fights you've had altogether, but I'd just be curious to get some of your favorite moments um, right. from that journey. I've seen, obviously, some of the fights. I haven't seen them all, but I've definitely seen some, and uh, you've got some moments to be very proud of, you know, in that sport, so I love asking this question because it's usually not the answer you expect type of thing. You right. Know? So, yeah. um. One the one of my biggest moments that I've ever had in Muay Thai was my very first fight in Thailand. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know it's the one that I keep flying over the top of the ropes. Yeah, it was it was a Bukow show. Why well, I had fought in China on the undercard, and Bukow was the main event. So when he got it was the main event. I got I had my fight. They loved it. I come out and he said. Hey, I want you to fight for my show in Thailand. Of course, it's book out. Yes, I'm going to say yes. I get brought in, and that, unfortunately, what happened, what happened, me flying over the top ropes, getting ahead, but everything. Um, one of the biggest moments of that fight, obviously, fighting in Thailand, the Mecca of the eight limbs. Uh, one of the biggest moments that I remember was the first time we went over the top ropes, in my head, I'm going, I can't believe this has happened again. It's happened a couple fights in the past. Um, but I remember sitting on the uh, edge of the ring, and then Bukow pops up. He, he actually checks on me himself. And he comes from the audience, runs over and says, are you okay? And in my head, I'm thinking, wait, you're Bukow. Why, why are you speaking to me? This is awesome. But no, I'm okay. Let's, let's keep going. Let's keep fighting. So end up got back in the fight. For me, that was one of the best moments in Muay Thai, being in Thailand, getting a getting a fight on one of the, the biggest guy show in the world, which for me was amazing. Um, second, uh, my number one moment in Muay Thai in Thailand was winning the Muay Thai belt. Now, don't get me wrong. Yes, it's amazing, but also getting the fight in Rajanam Stadium and being the first of my weight class from America fighting in the Satan, which I thought was unbelievable, and actually fighting for the world title as well. That to me was amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It is absolutely extraordinary. Um, you know, once in a lifetime moment, I'm just I'm so special. Um, you also, you mentioned about your, your weight class there. I mean, are Thai people fascinated by um, seeing heavyweights in, in their sport because obviously I know it's obviously now there's there's more people but obviously traditionally um, there's a lot of smaller guys and it's in yeah, more recent yeah. years it's opened up to different weight classes so I was just curious like if in the culture if there's like a fascination you see big guys go at it or if they're sort of used to it now you know I would I would like to see fighters more active than what they've been recently I understand why they are not as active. Do I agree with it? No, of course not. I want to see entertainment. That's what we do. We're in it for entertainment. I would like to see fighters more active. Yes, it still go, it goes back to promoters, but it also goes back to the fighter. But I also believe fighters should stay in shape all year long, which I think puts on – it allows fighters to be able to put on a better show a better performance if they do come in shape. 
No, I don't want them standing in front of each other and giving each other brain damage. No, not that. I want to see fighters going out there and putting on a show to the crowd absolutely wants to see him again. I would love to see that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes total sense. Well, you definitely do that anyway. You know, you definitely put on a show. But I get what you mean with, with the other guys. You know, uh, it makes sense. Um, people always want to hear about toughest fights as well. I mean, this is sort of a... Uh, and, and sort of a fun question, I think you know. And as I as I mentioned at the beginning, and I know I keep saying, but you've competed in multiple of the toughest sports on earth you can do. But specifically in the in the Muay Thai world um, as well. But also, if any others come to mind, if anything comes to mind from any of the other sports as well, just all around, you know, the, the toughest fights that you've had. Uh, it'd be great to hear about. Those. It's it's actually a very easy choice to say which one was my toughest fight. My toughest fight was my fifth fight ever in MMA. I fought a guy named J.P. Wilson in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. It is the only fight that made me go, the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? And it was the only fight that I've ever had that I questioned, should I just roll over? And because I'm taking a beating. Um, but it was, it was the only fight that I've ever had. It was like, yeah, this is this. Oh, shit, this is bad. I don't remember majority of the fight. I remember bits and pieces of the fight. I won a split decision. If they would have told me I lost that fight, I'd have been okay with it. I'd have been 100% okay if they had told him that he'd won. Because that was by far the hardest fight that I've ever had. I had both my eyes were swelled shut for about two weeks. I had to ice my face every day to where my eyes would open up to where I could even drive or do anything. I was in a, I was driving a salt truck. I would drive with the window down just so where the cold air would hit my face to help me with the swelling in my face. I had black eyes for four months, five months. My gums were black. I thought I was going to lose a couple teeth. I mean, that was by far the absolute hardest fight that I've ever had. Wow. That is brutal. I mean, that is very, very brutal, um, especially the length of time that, you know, some of those injuries lasted as well. Um, you know, you don't hear that too often. You do hear about it, but you don't hear it as often. I mean, usually a few weeks and, and people are okay unless it's like broken bones or much deeper bruises. But man, you know, black guys for months, that's, that is pretty wild. Well, um, obviously that was your toughest fight uh, that comes to mind. Talking about MMA uh, as well, just to give that a mention, I asked you of your, of your proudest moments in, in kickboxing, Muay Thai and, and everything, but do you have proudest moments in MMA as well? Because obviously that's quite a different sport with the grappling aspect as well and the, you know, the punches and kicks. So it's, with with MMA, I've, I've made a lot of friends that I would call very good friends. Um, the, the very first guy that I ever fought in MMA, uh, Mike Williams. I'm, I'm good friends with him still. This is almost 20 years ago. I talked to him yesterday. Uh, he's, the, he's one of the guys that I've been around since I've been in the sport that I'm still friends with. I'm still friends with guys that I first started training with. It's, it's a bigger community community of uh, family than what a lot of people realize. Like, I, I've, I've known guys who started jujitsu when I started striking who have their own schools now, and they're, they're excelling. They're becoming teachers and instructing and, you know, helping other kids get better. And to see, to see guys do that, it's great to see. Yeah. Absolutely, I like that. I like the the family aspect, the connections. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot of respect in in MMA and in that world. I've seen that as well, uh, more than there is in in like boxing. As I work with a lot in pro boxing, and as I say, it's more respect in MMA, you know, than there is in uh, in some other sports. You know, obviously in in Muay Thai as well, there's a lot of yeah. a lot of respect. So something I've been looking forward to asking you about a great deal is the Valley Trudeau um, side of things as well, because that's a really fascinating okay. world. And it's something that a lot of people don't see, um, you know, from the outside and everything. And I think Valley Trudeau, it's got that legendary status 
um, about it, and, and rightly so. Um, and it's a source of fascination for a lot of people. So with this, I don't have um, like a really narrow question about it, but I'd just love to hear your experience about you know going to Brazil, competing in Valentino, and what it was like there, and just anything that you'd like to share about it, really. I mean, it's just super cool. I, I enjoyed Brazil. I thought it was a blast. Yeah. To, to be able to eat fruit, like star fruit, floating in a pool and reach up and grab fruit off a tree that's around the pool can never beat that. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was hot. God, it was hot. We stayed in a tree house. Um, the area that we, they put us up in Manaus and we were in Manaus. Our actual room was up in a tree house, a legit tree house. In the middle of the night, you heard like a big cat scream. That's what we were told it was. We didn't ask questions. Um, we had an absolute blast. I've got to fight on the same car with like Kevin Ross, Nissan Ostrinac, Dominic Mehi, uh, Tebow Washington out of Myrtle Beach. Uh, we all got to go down and fight Valley Tudor Championships. The one thing I liked about it because we were allowed to soccer kick each other in the head if we got knocked down on the ground, which we always wanted to do growing up. So when they offered the opportunity to be allowed to do it, why not? Go down there and have a blast doing it. We got to see my house. We got to go through uh, the mall and eat sushi at the mall. And to this day, there was one of the most beautiful Thai women that I've ever seen walk by in the mall. A blue dress. I remember it's clear as day. She walked by and I meet my ice cream and I just stopped and looked at her and went like this. Couldn't believe it. One of the, hot, one of the most beautiful women that I've ever met in my life. And she all she did was walk by. Yeah, amazing. Well, you know what? I'm uh, I'm booking a vacation to Brazil now. You you know you got me sold. <laughs> and, uh, it's hot in Brazil. It is hot. Yeah. Manaus was very hot. Yeah, yeah. There's amazing experience. I mean, you know, these are these are experiences that um a lot of people can only dream of and. I don't know if, if you realize it or not, but I, I think this has an inspirational aspect as well because for any up and coming fighters out there who are you know starting to chase a dream or they're not sure if they want to do it or whatever, you know, you show what's possible from you know chasing the dream and obviously taking some big risks, but it's it's worth it on the other side. I don't I don't know if you realise that it might sound strange, but it really shows them um uh, what's possible. <laughs> So, you know, um, amazing, absolutely amazing. Valley Trudeau, um, absolutely brutal. So, obviously, one of the things we're talking about here is the different places in the world that you've um, spent time and, and you've visited through fighting. Yes. Um, and we've mentioned, obviously, Brazil, we've mentioned Thailand, you've been to some amazing places. Um, do you have a favorite place that fighting has taken you? I'm aware it might be Thailand, it might be right where you are, but it might also be somewhere else. So, in your own words, Take it away with that one, please. For me, Thailand was always Mecca. Mm -hmm. Thailand was me going to heaven. Um, even my great uncle said, if I ever got a chance to move to Thailand, I'd never move home. Um, he passed away while I was here, and he said, well, see you in Thailand. And my mother, the same thing. They knew when I came over here, Thailand to me is home. Mm -hmm. I love Thailand. Mm -hmm. I can tell. I mean, your passion for it really, um, really comes over in such a good way, you know. Um, absolutely. So, another couple of things to touch on here. Um, well, actually, before we get to that, so basically, with Thailand, I mean, you think you're always going to stay now until, like, you know, the rest of your life type of thing? If, if I have an opportunity to stay here as long as I can, I will. Yeah. I love Thailand. I like how they treat people. I like the respect that they give, the, hum the people are humble. I like it. I like the fact that when people are here, they're happy. You can tell when somebody's going home because they get sad. Mm. But when you're here, you're happy. Yeah, totally. Totally. Well, I hope you get to stay there as long as you can. And I hope you keep living the dream. You know, I mean, that's, that's just honest wish for me to you, you know, keep living the dream, man. That's a hundred percent. So moving into a couple of um, more sort of intangible things in terms of uh, this, one of the things I want to touch on with you is, is the mental side of, of combat. Now, we will talk about your physical training as well soon, mm -hmm. 
but I feel that the mental side of, of combat is often overlooked um, and it's something I find fascinating because even though it's obviously it's a physical thing uh, when two people come together for the stare down and things you, you've probably seen this you can often get a feel of, of who's going to win and it's not just from their style or um, like their style or their fitness and things even though that but it's also like the will and the, the intensity you know so when you're on the build up to a big fight on important fight what is going through your mind I mean are you visualizing it focusing on it are you sort of putting it out of your mind and just concentrating day to day I mean what, what's your process for that type of thing basically well when we when we do any type of train like when you're building up to to a fight the last couple of days are usually the hardest because you're not physically pushing yourself in training and you've only got like three, four days before a fight, then you just sit and constantly think about the fight all the time because that's the big thing that's coming up in your life. And it's just, it's one of those things you just got to mentally realize that no matter what you do, that it's one-on-one -on -one and you're going to be in front of thousands plus people and they're going to make, they're going to make fun of you. They're going to laugh at you, scream at you, call you names. They'll get over it. You know, I was a college cheerleader. You can say anything you want. You're not going to ruffle my feathers. I'm good. I learned, I learned how to be in front of a crowd being a college cheerleader because you would continue to say, hey, faggot. Hey, queer. Hey, cocksucker. You hear everything. Just being a mere cheerleader. You're throwing a girl in the air, you know, 120 pound girl throwing her up in the air, catching her with one hand. But people are going to still make comments. Okay, fine. So it's one of those things that you're in the limelight, but then when you get to do like combat sports, it's more of limelight. But once you're inside, like once you're inside the cage of the ring, however you're fighting, for me, I'm still able to think right in the middle of being in a combat sport. Not, oh, I hate this guy. Nah, it's okay. I have no, I have no ill will toward Mick Terrell at all. I wish him the best. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's no reason. There's no reason. If I fight with anger, I make mistakes. Mm. It's not worth it. It's interesting, and it's it's, it's a very good, uh, very good insight into what's going on in your head. Because obviously, people don't see that. You know, I mean, obviously, other right. fighters. No, fighters will know what it's like, but fans, you know, they have no idea. So, you know, it's it, it's good to give them an insight. But as well as that, um, yeah, I mean, by the way, Mick Terrell, yeah, big shout out to him, you know, because uh, he's he's one of our best over here as well, you know, um, ex world champion and everything. You know, he was on his show with me uh, only maybe like a month ago or something like that. He's a great guy. Um, but anyway, going back to you, so yeah, the no ill will thing. Um, but would you say that you have? Like, um, you still have that killer instinct, though. I mean, you know, because one of the things is not not all fighters have that. I mean, some people, um, you know, they're very technically skilled, they're very athletic, but bringing it out from within is obviously a different thing. And obviously, I'm I'm sitting talking to you, and and you know, you're a nice guy, you're a great guy. We've been talking for a long time on Facebook and things, but I get that vibe that you could really bring out like a proper killer instinct in the ring if you know like in, in the true sense am i right in saying that i mean because you described yourself as very cool calm and collected in there you know i i prefer when it's in combat sports if i can keep my cool and collective i don't like losing my temper if i lose my temper i do dumb things and can get in trouble i don't like going to the nightclubs any party anything due to the fact that i'm a big guy i'm going to stand out I don't like stupidity. I'm going to tell you I don't like stupidity. I don't like people touching me. So it's one of the things I'm just like, get away. Mm. I prefer in combat sports, my biggest, my biggest concern in bare knuckle, in Muay Thai, in kickboxing, MMA, any combat sport that I do, if I can entertain and give the people something that they can go, man, did you, did you see what he did? I'm winning. If I'm able to come to class and I help one person throw a jab correctly, I'm winning. So no matter what I do, as long as I'm helping 
someone get half a percent better? If they see, if they, someone sees me get knocked out, huh, this is what you don't do. This is what you don't do when you get knocked out. When you want, when you don't want to get knocked out, do this. You know, I prefer, I prefer being absolutely able to entertain. It makes sense, and but you certainly do that. I mean, that's that's all I can say about that. You definitely do that. Um, but the whole thing about staying calm and depression and all that, it's a valuable life lesson as well, you know. I mean, people can apply that in any situation that they're in that's, that's high pressure, you know, stay in the moment, stay with what's actually happening, not what you think about what's happening, you know, and, and things like that. It's, you know, it's, it's very, uh, very, very important. Um, let's touch upon your physical training and your, you know, your sort of daily regime. Um, I think this will be really interesting for people you know, a day inside the life of a world champion of a high level mm -hmm. fighter. Again, other fighters will know this, but, you know, fans and other people, they don't see the amount of work that they in. Um, I see it, I'm often in camp with people, even on the media side, so I know, but a lot of people don't know. So yeah, a day in your life, training-wise. I don't run. Okay. I'm not running. I'm not going to run. I now I'm good. You can do as much running as people want. I won't run. Um, I get up in the morning. My first class is eight to ten o'clock in the morning, Muay Thai. Um, like right now, because I've got camp, um, camp for the last eight to twelve weeks. Like Monday, Wednesday, Friday would be conditioning in the middle of the days, uh, cardio Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays, um, lifting weights twice a week doing the bag drills, doing the class. So you got two hours in the morning, two hours at night. And then in the middle of the day, you're doing an hour and a half. Sometimes to help get ready for the time change difference, uh, do pad work at two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Um, just uh, to get them moving, moving around at that time frame. Mm -hmm. Like I know it's a night, it's a what, five hour difference, I believe you said. Oh, uh, seven. It's, it's actually. Oh, seven. Of, okay. Quite a big difference. Yeah. But it's funny, actually. Because sometimes um, I message you when we were setting this up in it's sort of like my night time, so I'm like about to go to bed or whatever, it's like 2 a.m. or something, and I message you and for you it's like 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., you know, things like that. So, um, But it's, it's one of those things I do because I deal with a lot of people around the world, we've got a lot of right. friends around the world. But it's quite funny, actually, because I, I think about it, because a few times I've messaged you saying, oh, you're coming can we set it up at this time or whatever? And I'm literally just about to, to hit the sack. But for you, your day is just starting, you know? And I've got to be honest, the time the time difference, I, I think it's pretty wild, man. I'm used to it, yeah. but it's, it's pretty wild, you know? I've, yeah. I've always been the person, I can stay up very late, 12, 1, 2 o'clock, mm -hmm. and then be up at 4, 5, 6 in the morning and get my day started. Mm -hmm. But I've been, I've been able to do that since I was a child. Stayed yes. up with my great uncle watching, you know, old military movies, old Western movies. Get up early, five, six, seven in the morning, work on the farm, feed the cows, just different things. And you just get kind of used to it. Absolutely. Yeah, I can, I can do that as well. You know, whatever I was need to be done, you know, you can, you can do it. But uh, your body clock can adapt to, to anything, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk a little bit about about your upbringing because I know I said we're working backwards in time, really. Basically, I know we've moved yep. around a little bit, but I'm um, curious to uh, to go back in time almost completely to where it all began for you, and also to get a feel for at that time, obviously, what inspired your interest in martial arts and combat. Mm -hmm. um, if you always believed you'd get as far as you have um, and become world champion. No, actually, I didn't. Um, okay. When I first started fighting, I wanted to learn self-defense. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn how to defend myself if I ever got hit in a club or out on the park or anything. I wanted to learn how to defend myself. Mm -hmm. And I actually always thought that I would be a grappler, that I would be a striker. I always thought I'd be a grappler. And just I just ended up realizing that striking was much easier. Way easier than grappling. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and in terms of your upbringing, I mean, you mentioned like a um, like a farm, and you mentioned somebody. I mean, I don't know much about this. I mean, I know obviously you're from the U.S. originally, 
Yep. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of stuff out there about your your upbringing, but you mentioned your great uncle and, and being close to him. So I was just curious about like your your early life and where you're from and what it was like and who influenced you um, mm -hmm. early on. Just just some of that. I will. Right, I'm from I'm from Morganton, North Carolina. I was born in Hickory, North Carolina. Grew up in Morganton, North Carolina until eighth grade. Moved up for Linville, back down to Lenore all in little areas of the mountain area of North Carolina. Um, going into high school, I moved uh, to Kentucky to live with my grandmother uh, in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Um, Hopkinsville, Kentucky, went, was there for four years, got a college uh, football scholarship, went to Campbellsville University for four years. Uh, my first year, I was working with one of the ladies work study, um, Ms. Donna. Donna Pierce, and I ended up. She was one of the cheerleading. She was the cheerleading coach, and she just convinced us, like, oh, you know, just come out and try. And I'm like, no, I'm not gay. I don't do that crap. I ain't gonna do that queer shit. And I met a girl, and I thought she was just absolutely gorgeous. And I'm actually still friends with her. I've been friends with her for since ninety nine, two thousand. Laura Hall. I'm still friends with her. I talked to her last week. Um, she, I thought she was absolutely gorgeous when we were, uh, when we, when I was in college, she was in high school. Um, she convinced me that, you know, I should be a cheerleader. So she was my first stunt partner throwing in the air. And for me, it was weird throwing someone in the air and trying to catch them without letting them hit the ground. And to learn actually the proper way to do it was a lot harder than you realize. So being, being a cheerleader in college, playing football in the fall, cheerleading in the springtime, I mean, a lot of it does uh, excel for fighter wise just because we're in the limelight. We're in front of the camera. We're in front of people. That's the, I think I'd say that's one of the best things that actually helped me out as a fighter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, to be honest, with the cheerleading and with your whole background and with the football. Um, there's a lot more, there's a lot of skill that goes into these things. Uh, we've touched on the cheerleading, which, which is, is quite cool. I mean, it's quite, I think it's quite novel in a way. It's, it's, it's something different, but I totally get that the motivations and um, it's really cool, actually, you know, the skill. I mean, you're throwing someone up and, yeah, to not let them hit the ground, that's, that's pretty wild, man. Um, what about football? I mean, what about some of your favorite moments um, with that side of things? I mean, because I still think you mentioned right at the beginning about being competitive and about having that competitive edge and you love that, you know, um, that mental toughness and competing with people. And obviously football is, is like that as well, um, you know, and, and something actually, um, I'm making a distinction here, American football, I love it because obviously over here we have soccer and everything. I'm not mm -hmm. really... And of, of that, to be honest, even yes. though it's popular. Um, rugby, I don't know if you're familiar with rugby, that's sort of similar to... The only thing I don't like about rugby, you can't hit everybody. You no. can only hit the guy with the ball. Uh, yeah. I, if you're in my way and I'm running that way, I'm trying to run through you. Absolutely. Because in American football, you can do that. Absolutely, that's part of what's really cool about it, you know. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm with you on that. So this is why I think this is pretty. This is going to be pretty cool to get into as well. Um, talk to us a little bit about some of your highlights of of American football, but also um, if I'm curious if it prepared you for combat or if or if there was any cross you know correlation with the competitive. Uh, I actually I do a lot of I do a lot of offers and linemen foot, foot drills. Okay. Because I believe being an offensive lineman actually benefited me more than I realized when it came to combat sports. Yeah. Due to the fact that in American football, I've got guys that are big as I am or bigger that I've got to go one on one against in the trenches. And there's some days that I just have to get in your way to prevent you from trying to tackle my quarterback or the running back, et cetera. Sometimes I have to go forward and move you out of the way, not lose my balance, keep my base, stay up, vice versa, always having to move. So I think I think even even with basketball, I've learned 
any sport that I've ever played, I've not, I don't, I do not believe that I have found a sport that does not correlate to some kind of fighting mm. of every sport. When you run, you're twisting your hips, you, you're up on your toes, you're trying to move faster. Football, yeah. you're trying to go forward, backward, left, and right, stay balanced, even when you're getting hit with a larger item of the other person trying to hit you. Yeah. Playing basketball, when you're trying to protect the rim or you're boxing out, every sport that out there, unless you're trying to play Pokemon, and I don't, I don't know how that, I don't know how that, that would work. <laughs> Pokemon, yeah, not, me neither, man. I got no clue. But yeah, with, with those other sports, I absolutely am with you on that. Um, and it's pretty cool, actually, because as well as talking about fighting, obviously, we've got, um, we've got the, the football side of things, the cheerleading. Uh, so you played basketball as well then, obviously, I, I guess. from I played, I played basketball in high school. Um, I was very good at fouling. Mm. It's very good at fouling. Um, my biggest problem for me was over being over aggressive. Mm. Um, I would, when you go for with a rebound, I would take your legs out by just throwing my body in the way. Obviously not the best way to do it, but I was just overly aggressive when it came to playing basketball. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can understand that because obviously we touched on um, learning to control that and learning to um, manage that and keep it cool. And obviously, yeah. you know, I think that's a valuable lesson because obviously, learning to keep it cool naturally means that there was a point in time when you would have been more hot-headed or, or whatever. Um, and again, it's, it's good to um, to get into that because once again, it's, it's a life lesson for people. You know, it's, it is a life lesson that actually being too aggressive, in the end, it really comes back on you. Um, you know, it really it can actually cause a person doing it more problems. Obviously, a bit of aggression moves you forward in life, but too much can actually knock you back, you know, so it's, it's, that's a good, uh, good life lesson. When you were growing up, though, what about um, what about like street fighting or anything like that? Or you know, what, was that something? Because you mentioned at the very beginning, like about if you look at somebody the wrong way, it all goes down. It's exactly the same here in, in the UK. You know, like I never liked. I never liked losing my temper mm. because I lose. If I lose my temper, I, I'm not able to think. I do really dumb shit. Yeah. Um, in high school, I remember getting cut off at the road at a light where guys get out of the vehicle and they're ready to fight and you just slam it on the, in the gear and just go hit whatever's in front of you. But it's one of the things that I know, I know that if we're fighting in the streets, it's either your life or my life. Mm. If you're dumb enough to try to fight me on the streets, it means you're dumb enough to try to take my life. If you're dumb enough to try to take my life, it means I've got to, I've got to be dumb enough to defend myself and take your life. Mm. I'd much rather never have to fight outside of the ring or club. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes total sense. But there, that's the, that obviously makes sense to me now as well, because that's obviously what I was picking up on with that. You know, because I can feel it like that, the fire in your belly, that they, I mean, it is there, but obviously you've learned how to channel that, you know? Uh, and I do mean that. I mean that in a good way because it's not, a, it's not a bad thing to have. It can be a good thing to have. It's all about how you use it, you know? Um, I do I believe I do believe that if I had never started fighting, my temper might have gotten me in trouble mm. because I like to be competitive. I like to be doing something. Mm. And one of the ways that I'm able to release my anger is hitting a bag and, and training and exhaust myself instead of taking my anger out on other people. Yeah, makes total sense. Really does, really does. It's, it's a great lesson. I mean, that is something I try and do with these interviews anyway, you know, is when, we, when I'm talking with people, it's good to get into, um, I like to, basically, when we're talking about fighting and we're talking about all the cool stuff, I like to lace it through with just a little bit of inspiration, just a little bit of message, you know, that, that somebody mm -hmm. has learned from the, uh, their own life experience with different people of, of learning different things, you know, and you about like channeling your energies in a constructive way. It's a brilliant message, man, because there's so many people out there who are, you know, they don't have direction, they don't have focus, they don't have that type of stuff. And then it's really easy, you know, for your emotions to, to fly off the handle. So, you know, your message of, of focusing that into something, um, <coughs> excuse me, whether it's fighting or whether it's something else, it's, it's a good message. 
Um, I have to ask you one thing I am curious about. What is tattooed on your hands, though? Because I keep seeing... Um... Yeah. Uh, it says, no worries. Okay. Yeah, yeah. no worries. Akuda <laughs> Matata. I like that, man. It's very... Because um, I think I've seen a, a photo or something of you on your, on your Facebook or somewhere, but it's just uh, very, very cool. It's quite unique. And as you say, you can just hold them up and, and show yeah. people. Yeah, no worries. Um, oh, very cool. Well, we've talked about a lot of stuff here. The last thing I really want to touch on before wrapping this up fairly soon, or the last couple of things, or maybe, maybe two more things, it's getting late for you as well, so I obviously I respect that, is um, obviously your future plans, because we what we've done is we've spent a bit of time looking back. You've achieved a lot. Obviously, we've got this big fight coming up um, in the UK. You know, it's around, and it, that's going to be... Um, a hell of a fight and, and a hell of a, of a show, you know, because the way they're matching guys up on there, mm -hmm. it is quality. Um, you know, every fight is 50-50, is really. Um, but in terms of looking sort of beyond that, I know you, you don't want to look too far ahead because take it one fight at a time, but just broadly in terms of your dreams and your goals and what's sort of motivating you, inspiring you now that you'd like to do over the next year, the next couple of years, that type of thing. I want to be able to put on a show as often as possible mm -hmm. just to get more fans involved in the sport. Not just not just have it to where people go, oh, pay me, pay me, this, 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 this. You should know this about me. I believe, like, for me, for fighting-wise, like, I'm just happy. I'm happy to be doing something I enjoy. That, to me, is amazing. I'm 41, and I'm doing something I enjoy. I'm competing. I'm still playing sports. I get up every morning and I can still move. So, I mean, I'm going to keep doing it. Amazing. Yeah. Well, that's it. Living the dream, like I said, you know. Um, very blessed. So, pretty much the last thing, um, well, the last couple of things. One thing, we've touched upon a bit of advice for people through this, this interview about, like, yeah. What we mentioned earlier, you know, channeling your emotions, and there's been quite a few different things. You're know, taking a leap and, and chasing your dream, taking risk. You know, quite a few different things. Um, is there any other advice that you'd like to share for anybody who uh, wants to pursue um, a big dream or a big goal, whether it's in fighting or whether it's in another life area? I, I don't mind. Yep. Just like to on that. Ask questions. Mm. Ask questions. If you don't ask questions, you're never going to learn the answer. You might think you can Google everything. Ask questions. Just ask. When I had a coach in middle school. You know, you always have people who tell you there's no, there's no dumb question, only dumb answers. Or I think that's how it's put out. Um, my coach in middle school, his biggest thing was do it right, do it light, do it wrong, do it long. And if that stuck with me, do the fact he goes, no matter what you do, if you're doing it right, life and everything will come easier. If you give yourself a hard road to go down, it's going to be a hard road to go down. And it was one of those things you get, I had to learn to understand as I got older. So no matter what I do, if I'm doing something that feels good, it makes me happy, then I'm doing something right. I feel, do it right, do it like. Every day I get to wake up. My my biggest thing that I do when I wake up in the mornings is walk my dog, my dogs. This to me is the best thing in the world. I get to walk my three babies. Yeah, I love that. I love some really good advice there. And it's, uh, it's good wisdom for people because obviously when I put this out, it could go all over the world and Hopefully some of that wisdom will sort of filter down um, and, and people will pick up on it, you know. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that. Um, last question, because like I say, it's, it's getting late in, in your evening. Um, just any thank yous, because at the end of the day, I, I like to close out interviews in this way, because obviously whether it's thanking the fans, um, we've given mention to certain coaches, but basically this is just for the other people who contribute to your journey um, because even though at the end of the day you're in the ring or the, the cage or whatever fighting and it's, it's down to you at that point 
but there's a lot of good people who do work behind the scenes um, and they're often not uh, appreciated, even if, it, obviously, a lot of it's physical, but even sometimes it can just be people supporting you on social media, messaging you or encouraging you or whatever. It doesn't matter what form it takes. But is there anyone that you'd, you'd like to just give a shout out to or anything before we wrap this up? A lot of, a lot of the guys who helped me out, a lot of my sponsors that I have that, that are helping me uh, with supporting through like training camp, helping for medicals. Um, if I need a supplement, Gorilla Supplements. If I love this. It's just called Super Greens. I absolutely love it. It helps get all the extra vitamins, minerals, and I get it from Gorilla Supplements here in Thailand. Phuket Top Team, it's my home. I train here. I've been with the same coach now for seven years, which is amazing. I've never, I never got that opportunity growing up. Um, Cyan Blades, they're my uh, one of my most current sponsors. Um, when I fought for Fight Circus, one of the trophies was one of their blades, which was amazing. I've still got the blade. I've got it hanging above my world title. Um, let's see. Uh, the, I, I know I'm going to say their name wrong. I always do. The Fleur Bermadoodles. They're the hypo style allergenic dog. They're a designer dog. Um, back home, they're one of my they're one of my sponsors as well. They've been with me for four years now, five years. Um, Phuket Top Team, Siam, Gorilla Supplements, uh, Family Rich, Family Rich Movement. Uh, it's the meaning behind it. You know, you're, if you have family, you're rich. You have the family, you're rich because of it. Because you've got something a lot of people don't ever get an opportunity to have. Being family rich, you've got family, you're happy. And it doesn't have to be blood to the family. Dominic May, he's that guy. He's over on the family rich movement. Um, he actually fought in, uh, what was it? It was actually the Bangkok, Bangkok part of the last show. He ended up yeah. fighting on that as well. I fought with him down in Brazil. I've known him about 15 years now. Amazing. Yeah. Well, it's good to give them a shout out because there's some people doing some amazing work behind the scenes and it's just good to give them, um, I mean, they know who they are, you know who they are and people in, in, in your circle do, but it's just nice to give them a little mention on the, on the sort of wider reach. Um, yeah, Fight Circus, was that the one where you were fighting like multiple opponents? Um, I saw something on, I saw something online where I think there was something you were, you had like more than one opponent in there or something. It was like, uh, yeah. Um, when I fought with fight circus, I fought three guys in, uh, at the same time. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. That yep. was one. Three different guys. It was, was fun. Good. It was something I was not expecting. Um, they had done the two versus one. And of course, you know, I'm asking them like, Hey, I'll do three versus one. And John nut goes the deal. Is set up and you're fighting on the next show. So I ended up fighting three guys at one time. That's wild, man. I mean, yeah, again, you know, testing yourself in the toughest sports. But, Champ, it's been a real pleasure, you know. it's uh, It's been really good to talk with you um, today, you know, obviously your evening, my, my afternoon, and to take this time to, to share everything we've shared and hopefully as well as talking about the, um, the fights and everything, we've gone into some deeper stuff. And we've made this a little different than your average um, fight interview, which is what I aim for. So really, the last thing uh, for me to say is, once again, just to thank you for your time and thank you for fitting this in and thank you for being an open book, really, and sharing uh, so much about thank your life. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.